I'm Mike Parr. I'm president of American Bird Conservancy. And we're here this evening to talk about birds. We've already been talking about birds. Um, this group of panelists is pretty unstoppable on this, this topic, which we all have a, a lot of passion about. Many of us have been doing this our whole lives and we, we really enjoy birding, but I also recognize there'll be people joining this webinar who maybe aren't used to birding as much and we hope to have some things for everybody. We really want to talk about birds, how much fun it is to watch birds and also what we can do to help birds. And the topics we'll cover today in particular are how to attract birds to your yard, um, how to connect with other backyard birders and how to identify some of the birds you're seeing, whether they are familiar birds or some of the difficult birds we've just been talking about, some of the Coopers and Sharp Shinhawks and others, um, how to get involved in citizen science and how to make sure that any sightings you've got contribute to our knowledge about conservation. And then also how to help birds around your property, uh, your yard, no matter whether that's uh, a large ranch, a suburban yard or something in between, or even if you're living in an apartment, things that you can do to help birds in your environment. Um, given the current challenges we're all facing, backyard birding seems to be taking on a special meaning for many of us. Um, and at ABC, uh, we're having a lot of fun with it. Um, it's sort of become a bit of a stress reducer for us um, because we're all trying to balance a lot of different things at home at the moment. And we have our bird therapy hashtag, which we've got on social media and people are posting with that hashtag and uh, we're compiling people's sightings, which has been a lot of fun for us. Um, and you know, we're, we're all now getting used to these Zoom meetings and as we power through our day, uh, we can take a couple of minutes and take a look in the yard and hopefully enjoy a few birds that are coming in. Um, the aim we have this evening is to make sure we cater to both beginners and more experienced uh, birders. We're gonna keep the presentations to around 30 minutes and have 15 minutes for questions. Uh, then we'll provide some links for further information that you might be interested in. And you can also email us uh, with further questions later on. And uh, be ready to jot down the email address we'll provide at the end of the, the presentations so that you can uh, know uh, what that address is to send further questions. So that'll be on a screen at the end. Um, I'd just like to sort of start by thanking my co-presenters, Jeff Gordon, who is the president of the American Birding Association, uh, and Ken Rosenberg, who's an applied conservation scientist who works both with American Bird Conservancy and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, uh, and Jennifer Cipolletti, who is the Deputy Director of Policy at American Bird Conservancy. Uh, thanks also to Jordan Rutter, who will be helping to moderate with the questions, and then to Claire Nielsen, Connor Marshall, and Darius Shabkowski, who are helping with the tech and making sure that the webinar runs smoothly. Thanks to everyone there, and also thank you for for everybody who on this webinar is already a member or supporter of either ABC uh, or Cornell or all three. If you're not already a member, uh, I would strongly recommend that you consider joining hopefully all three organizations. All three organizations do different but complementary things to help birds and to provide you with information about birds. And I think if you do join, you'll see that a lot of great resources that you'll get as well as being able to help those organizations and help their missions. Um, you may have heard uh, last fall, we released new data showing that uh, North American bird populations had declined by uh, around 30% over a 50 year period. And one of the things we do wanna focus on today, which Jennifer will be mostly covering, is the things that you can do around your property and yard to help birds and play your part in recovering those populations. Um, and we think that that's a very, very important part as well as enjoying birds, also giving back and doing something in your environment to help those birds, whether it be an apartment, uh, a ranch, as I said, or a suburban backyard. There are things that we can all do to enjoy and help birds. So um, I think the next slide, please. Okay, those are our presenters who you'll be seeing, uh, I've already mentioned, and the next slide. Beautiful indigo bunting photograph, there. that's terrific. So I'm gonna start, and each of the presenters will, will also give you some uh, top tips 
for what we think would be really uh, useful things if you want to either get into backyard birding or you want to dig deeper into backyard birding, you're already in, interested in it, what would be our top tips for things for you to focus on? Um, and so my, my top tips are to start with at least one feeder. Um, you want to provide food, uh, water, and shelter are the three main things that birds like. Um, so then a bird bath, uh, ideally with some movement in the water. We're using a sprinkler here at home, which has been quite attractive to birds that come in. Um, any kind of habitat where birds can roost or shelter and make sure to go organic and avoid pesticides for anything that you plant. Um, so once you once you've created a nice environment for birds and have a little bit of patience because it usually takes birds a little while to find those feeders. You can use things like sunflower seed, cracked corn, uh, niger seed, which is good for finches and siskins, suet for woodpeckers, and uh, all of those things. You'll attract those birds. There are a number of apps you can find to download, which will help you start to be able to identify some of those birds. Um, and I always say for people who are getting started, the first thing to do, there's a lot of different species, but if you can identify 10 common birds coming to your yard, that's a great start. And then if you start to get more serious, I think you'll enjoy birding a lot more if you get yourself a good pair of binoculars so you can really get up close and personal with those birds. Um, here at my house, we've started using one of the cars in our back drive to get close to some of the birds at the feeder and get some photographs of them with my son, Charlie, who's really been enjoying that. Uh, we have six tube feeders up. We've got three hummingbird feeders, and um, we've really managed to attract a lot of birds in a, a rel relatively short space of time. My son, Wesley, likes to call our backyard the bird Airbnb, um, and it's really been terrific. We've had uh, 49 species that we've either seen or recorded since March 23rd when the lockdown really began. So I'd like to uh, ask Claire if we could take a look at the next slide. So thank you, Claire. There's a lot of different um, types of feeders and different groups of birds. Uh, this is not an exhaustive uh, slide, but these are some of the birds and some of the types of feeders that you might like to use. Top left is the typical hopper feeder and you've got suet on the end. Suet is great for nut hatches, woodpeckers, um, sea tends to be good for a variety of species. We have a lot of brown-headed cowbirds, house finches, um, even mockingbirds and catbirds and woodpeckers will come into that. Um, for us, it's a little bit early for Orioles, but it depends where you are in the country. Um, really just putting out uh, a sliced piece of orange can be really attractive to Orioles. We've got our house wren boxes up to the top right. Um, the uh, two feeders with seeds, which are great for finches and, and chickadees and then hummingbird feeders. And on the bottom right, it's a slightly less clear picture, but that's actually a water feature. If you have moving water, that can be tremendously attractive to birds and uh, you can bring down warblers and a variety of other species. So um, you can continue to feed birds into the spring. Um, birds may find other sources of food, but you can certainly continue to feed birds. Um, so um, just as a, on a personal note, you, you probably noticed I originally come from the UK. I, I, you know, I first started my birding, feeding birds on a peanut feeder in the backyard. And that's really what led me into this whole passion and pursuit. And I know that Jeff is gonna talk a little bit more about how birding can really be a passport to enjoying uh, nature more broadly. But I hope for everybody who's on this call, um, if you haven't started with something in the backyard in terms of feeding, uh, I think you'll find some enjoyment from that. Um, and then getting to learn more about the birds that you're seeing and hopefully providing some great habitat and doing something to help birds as you're gonna hear from the next presenters. Um, so I think I will leave it there for now. I'll be ready to take any questions and I will hand it over to Jeff Gordon who is going to carry on with the webinar from here. So thanks again for joining and uh, Jeff, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, sir. And uh, thanks everybody else. Jeff, you're still on mute. Uh, that's a rookie mistake. Anyway, thank you very much. Um, okay, um, if we can just go to the next slide, Claire, I want to share a couple of quick tips with you. Um, the first one is birds bring the world to our door. Um, they are absolutely amazing and they reward 
every bit of attention that you pay to them. And it can be casual. It can be a life's work. Um, I would also say, you know, like Mike said, binoculars are fantastic. They'll open another world of interest and enjoyment. But a camera of some sort, even if it's just a cell phone camera, will add a lot to your ability to get more out of the birds, even in your backyard. Um, and don't forget, you know, there's a video recorder and there are audio recording programs. And a lot of times the sounds birds make are really important for identifying them and understanding them. And then the other thing I would emphasize, and it really goes back to the, the ABA's approach um, that is learn from other birders and share what you see. Um, all the organizations here all want a, a better future, a better world with more birders, more birds, more attention and priority placed on habitat. And, um, but our particular path to that is kind of by uh, building and strengthening the birding community. And um, again, you'll get a lot out of it. Um, can I go to the next slide, please? So, um, birding for me really has been a lifelong avocation and it, because I've, you know, worked as a tour leader and I do uh, events with the American Birding Association now, at least did until recently, um, has, has really literally gotten me around the world and a lot of the highlights of my life have involved birds in some way. Uh, can we go to the next slide? It's even gotten me on stage with an honest to goodness band. This is uh, outside of Chicago in Berwyn, Illinois, and I'm performing a song I wrote about Cedar Waxwings, which is our bird of the year this year with the band Bunker Town. That was really a thrill. Uh, next slide, please. Birds and birding give you something to care about, something to speak up for and speak out for. And that has increasingly uh, mattered to me as I've gone on in life. And next slide, please. And I gotta say, um, you know, I look back over the course of my life and so many of the relationships uh, from the personal to the professional have been formed um, around birds and birding in some way and I think made the richer for it. So, um, you know, that's a, <laughs> that's a pretty hardcore, uh, you know, birds have played a huge role in my life. But if we can go to the next slide, I wanna point out that it all started in my family's backyard when I was 12 years old. And we just had some bird feeders, which I always had a very casual interest in, but I just started to look at them and I started to notice things. And this is so silly and small, but I realized that the, the goldfinches in winter, like at the bottom of this picture, you know, I knew that they, the males lost their bright yellow color, color, but I thought you could tell the females from, they, they were streaky. And I was looking in my field guide and I realized, no, those aren't female goldfinches. Those are pine siskins. It's a completely different bird. I never even suspected it existed. And that really did open uh, a window on a whole new world. And if we can go on to the next slide, um, I uh, have, you know, from the age of 13 to well over 50, um, birds have always been there for me. So, um, Next slide is one of our um, ABA Young Birder Camps where we take teenagers out birding in amazing places like uh, Colorado or right here in the Mid-Atlantic uh, around Delaware Bay and environs. Um, Jordan Rudder, who's on the call, is, has been involved as a counselor in these two. Uh, just an amazing experience. We're devastated that we have to postpone these this year, but uh, look forward to resuming them and we're doing all kinds of online things in the interim. And if we can go to the next slide, um, right now, birding for all of us is looking a lot more like this. And um, that's okay, though, because of all the people on this call, you know, speaking, all the professionals I know, um, we all love birds in our own yard. And there's just a special thrill about it when... Uh, when you get birds in your yard. So uh, if we can go to the next slide, I'm gonna very quickly share with you a couple of things that I've been seeing in my yard just recently. Um, we had a, a nice day the other day, got out the hammock and looked up and uh, hey, if you can't go to Panama right now, uh, next slide, you know, Panama can come to you in the form of broadwing hawks that have been wintering there or even down in South America and are now coming back to breed. And in the next slide, um, 
we had 13 common loons fly over the house uh, the other morning on Saturday. That was a real thrill. Um, next slide, please. But, um, you know, even birds that are around in the dead of winter or all year, like this golden crown kinglets, Carolina wren, um, they're just miraculous creatures. And the more you watch, the more you see. And on the next slide, um, you know, this whole virus quarantine situation is terrible. But um, one thing that's kind of advantageous about it is we're all uh, locked down in a front row seat for this just incredible wave of spring migration where things like Blackburnian warblers and calliope hummingbirds, depending on where you live, um, are coming back and really brightening the landscape. So even if we can't move, um, they do come to us. And on the next slide, um, I want to just kind of transition out by emphasizing that birding really is improved by sharing. That's really the best way to learn. Here's a picture on the left I took of a burrowing owl, but the picture I really like is this other one I took with just my cell phone, and it's of 11-year-old Sebastian Casares from Hutto, Texas, with the photo he took of that burrowing owl, and just the pride and excitement in his face, and that is, is really typical. I think it's something you find again and again. And once you have photos of birds, if we can go to the next slide, one place, there's a lot of great resources online, but one that I'm gonna feature is a Facebook group that the ABA runs. It's called What's This Bird? Just go to facebook.com groups slash what's this bird. Um, and, and look at the motto, the tagline there from Pete Dunn about the difference between a beginning bird and experienced one is the experienced ones have made more mistakes. That's really true. Um, it's a no shame zone where you can go from asking about the most basic birds in your yard to the most complicated ID questions. And we like all of it and we're happy to help with all of it. And uh, finally, if we can go to uh, the last slide for me. I just wanna point out that birding will introduce you to a world of great people. And this will take you places and teach you things um, well beyond this quarantine and the current predicament we find ourselves in. So um, if it's not clear already, I'm a huge fan and uh, I'm so glad that you're all here and you're taking note of the birds even right around your yard. And with that, um, I'd like to turn it over to Ken Rosenberg. All right, I think um, I think I'm on. So uh, thanks, Jeff, and uh, hi everybody. Great to be here, uh, sharing our insights about uh, stay-at-home birding with you all this evening. So for me, birding is all the things that Jeff talked about uh, and Mike, uh, with the added dimension that while I'm birding, I'm also collecting data that I'm collecting data that for science and conservation. So working at both ABC and Cornell, I get to be on the front lines of conservation and behind the scenes studying bird populations and how to help them. So having recently published this report showing the loss of three billion birds, I know that the data collected by an army of citizen scientists is crucial. Yep, both sorry, it keeps going off. Are we uh, having a little problem? Okay, I'll call you right back. Okay, bye. Okay. Uh, all right, well, if somebody can't hear me, then let me know. I'll assume that was just somebody uh, jumping in. We can, um, we can hear you, Ken, and we'd like to remind everyone who's participating to please mute your uh, mute, mute yourself in case of background noise. Thank you. All right, thanks, Claire. Uh, so I was just saying just how important it is that uh, our army of citizen scientists is actually collecting the data that we could use to track bird populations. And it's really important uh, from now into the future that we use programs like eBird that I'm gonna be talking about um, and others to track populations into the future to see if our conservation efforts are successful. So uh, if you could go to the next slide, please. 
So as the world hunkers down uh, to fight this uh, COVID-19 pandemic, I think that birds can still be a beacon of hope. So like the other organizations represented here, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology offers a variety of resources to help you celebrate the wonder of birds from home. And you can find um, all of these resources at that website, which um, hopefully you can see. Um, so these range from a menu of citizen science projects that you can do throughout the year in the winter. or in the summer, all the way to a catalog of uh, games and learning experiences, deeper online courses about birds and birding that are offered by the lab's Bird Academy group. And uh, one of these courses is called Joy of Birding it was just released yesterday. And so I invite everybody to check out all these various resources at the Cornell Lab's uh, website. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so for those of us who are actually stuck indoors, we do have a set of live bird cams that are running and streaming 24-7. And I know that these have become enormously uh, popular, uh, really um, uh, qu quite a challenge to keep all the bandwidth uh, going with everybody streaming these bird cams. But uh, you can get an intimate look at owls and ospreys, albatrosses, Bermuda petrels, see exotic birds coming to feeders in Panama or not so exotic birds coming to feeders here in Ithaca, New York. And we currently have 11 bird cams up and running, um, seven at nests and, and four at feeders. So um, some people just keep these going as, as a background uh, as they're going through their, their daily activity to, and waiting and waiting for eggs to hatch and that sort of thing. So uh, the bird cams are really fun. For teachers and parents who uh, had to make this wholesale shift to online and at home learning, the lab's K through 12 education group offers free uh, resources developed originally for classroom teachers, but now we're making them available to everybody. And these include uh, a specially, special weekly email newsletter, which is full of science and nature focused ideas for kids. Um, and activities for, for cooped up kids. And there's a fresh batch of these ideas released every Friday for those who sign up uh, for the newsletter. Uh, next slide, please. Um, but for me, the simplest way to enjoy birds and make a significant contribution to science and conservation is through this program, eBird. So I've been birding for over 50 years, like uh, some of the others in, in our group here. And um, I've seen major advances in uh, optics, binoculars, spotting scopes, uh, birding books and apps. And I think eBird is one of those revolutionary advances that's changing the way uh, people interact with, bird, with, with birds. So eBird is, is simply an online application, website, database that allows you to enter a checklist of the birds you see from any time, any place in the world. And not only does eBird keep track of your own sightings and allow you to explore new birding areas, but every checklist you submit contributes to the world's largest biodiversity database and provides data that's critical for bird conservation. So with eBird data, we can now visualize these incredible hemispheric migrations of birds like this barn swallow. And, and I could just stare at these animated maps uh, for hours. So, uh, this is all made possible through, through eBird data. Um, next slide, please. Well, I guess I, yeah, so I neglected to say that we have data on more than 10,000 bird species now from more than 43 million checklists submitted by over half a million birders uh, worldwide. Um, and now you can even find tips on how to bird mindfully uh, during the pandemic on the eBird website. But participating in eBird is really easy. All you need to do is download the free eBird mobile app to your phone. And the app shows you a checklist of the birds most likely to be found in your area, helps you plot your location on a map, and then you simply submit the checklist into the database with the push of a button. 
Next slide. Along with eBird, you can download the free Merlin app. And Merlin is just an incredibly uh, new tool. It serves as an interactive field guide to the birds in every region of the world now with photos, videos, bird sounds, range maps for, for every bird, all generated from the media that uh, volunteers have contributed to the Cornell Labs Macaulay Library. And it's also a powerful bird identification tool. So it uses artificial intelligence, facial recognition type computer learning to identify birds from either a simple set of features that you provide or a photograph. Uh, next slide. So you could also go to the eBird.org website and explore all kinds of um, features about birds. You could, you, could, you could explore by species, see where they're found throughout the year, look at lots of really cool maps of abundance, maps of migration, see what habitats they're using. You can also explore regions uh, where you'd like to go birding, and someday I hope that we can uh, all get to go, uh, to, to go to other regions again, but you can uh, do this vicariously. Uh, it could be a whole country, it could be your county, could be a birding hotspot. You can find out what's been seen in those areas and you can generate these really nice uh, bar charts that show you for every species what their uh, frequency of occurrence is for every month of the year for, for any area that, that you choose. Uh, next slide, please. So the, the last thing that I'd like to mention is that May 9th, on May 9th, eBird is hosting Global Big Day, which is an annual event uh, to see how many checklists we can collect and how many birds can be seen by the global uh, team um, in, in a single day, giving us an incredible snapshot of where birds are all over the world um, on this single day, May 9th. And last year, um, eBirders from 174 countries collected 92,284 checklists in a single day, reporting nearly 7,000 bird species. And we know that not everyone will be able to leave their home to bird this year, but anyone can participate wherever you are. You could enjoy birds from inside your house and still be part of Global Big Day. So taking part in these simple citizen science projects like eBird and collecting the data to help us track bird populations is one of the seven simple actions that we identified after the, the Three Billion Birds paper came out. And there are lots of other things that you can do around your home uh, to help birds, uh, part of these seven simple actions. And now I'd like to turn uh, this over to Jennifer Cipolletti from American Bird Conservancy, who's gonna talk about some of the other things you can do to help birds around the home. Jennifer, please unmute you, yourself. Everybody hear me? Yes, you're good. Yes? Excellent. Yes. Okay. Always some fun technical items. Hello, everybody again. Tan, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. And to all of our presenters tonight for some really fantastic information. There was one question in the chat box a while ago. Someone had asked where the presenters are from. I'll just speak on my behalf. I currently live in Washington, D.C., so that's where I'm reporting from tonight. So again, I'm Jennifer Cipolletti, Director of Conservation Advocacy for American Bird Conservancy. And tonight I will provide a brief overview of threats to birds that can be addressed from your home, especially considering the circumstances that we're under and we are spending a lot of time at home these days. So how can you help birds? Uh, and how can you do this from home? So we're gonna talk about reducing window collisions for birds. We'll talk about keeping cats indoors and not using chemicals in your yard. We will discuss mitigating all of these threats in and around your home and yard and also ways to provide and improve habitat for birds. Next slide, please. 
So we estimate there are up to 1 billion collisions a year with glass windows and doors in the U.S. alone. So collisions are the one experience with wildlife that everyone has had and most of us have or will have seen multiple. So transparent glass is invisible to both humans and birds, but people can see visual cues to anticipate the presence of glass and avoid collisions most of the time. So if you've ever seen someone walk into a sliding glass door, you kind of get the picture. Birds, however, don't have this ability and they perceive reflected images as literal objects, which explains why glass reflections, especially ones that present images of food, shelter, or an escape route can trigger collisions. But the good news is, is that there are solutions to this problem and they're simple and easy. Solutions are pretty much based on covering up glass or adding a pattern to that glass. This should always be on the outside of the glass rather than on the inside if possible. One way to do this is to put up exterior screens so you can see the photo on the right shows a window where the left side has an insect screen, it has almost no reflection. And the window on the right does not have a screen and is highly reflective. And the good news is screens are cheap and easy. So the photo on the left shows tempera paint, which is non-toxic. And this could be a really great project right now for kids or folks at home. It can help paint windows, windows while you're at home right now. Next slide, please. So we have some more solutions here. Uh, we've got ABC bird tape on the left. It's highly effective if you follow the two inch by two inch spacing rule. The middle photo shows feather friendly products, which are white decals of white dots two inches apart. And that's just one of the products that they offer. On the right is the Zen window curtain, otherwise known as a Copian bird savers. And they also have a how to make your own on their website, which is, could be a fun project right now um, while everyone is spending a lot more time at home. ABC has all of these solutions on how to make your windows bird friendly. So please visit our website whenever you have a chance. And we recommend that you take action. We're not asking or expecting anybody to do this for every window in their home or office. But if you've ever heard a collision on your window, you can treat that window. If you have windows or doors that are reflective, you can treat those too. And once you do that, wait until you hear or see another collision and then you do that window. And before you know it, you will have done most of the problem areas on your home. And the primary reason birds hit a window is that it sees the reflection of skies or trees in that window, or the window is transparent. And the bird thinks it can fly through habitat on the other side. And as these examples show, you can significantly reduce collisions with windows and doors by using simple and easy solutions. Next slide, please. So many of us at American Bird Conservancy have cats and we wanna make sure that they are safe and healthy, but we wanna protect birds too. So we know that there's an estimate that cats kill up to 2.4 billion birds each year. Outdoor cats do have shorter lives than indoor cats due to the numerous threats that they face, like predation, humans being hit by cars, and, and other things. Cats also transmit diseases to people and other cats. So what is the best, best way to help protect birds while keeping cats and people healthy? Well, keeping cats inside is a fantastic way to do that. Or if you need to take them outside, just make sure they're under control. Walk cats on leashes, which I used to walk mine on leashes and use catios. There's some really great options here in the photos that we've got, or even fence toppers. And another way to help mitigate this is not to feed outdoor cats. So feeding outdoor cats does contribute to a larger population and they are not a part of the natural ecosystem. And we wanna keep birds, cats, and people safe. So we're asking that people treat cats like they do dogs, just treat them responsibly. Next slide, please. So in the United States, there are about 4 million acres of manicured lawns. So to put that in perspective, it's about the size of Wisconsin, which is pretty large. So a huge percentage of these lawns are sprayed and fertilized and they're treated with weed killers. So they don't, you don't actually need to spray for anything. If you do buy seeds, just make sure that they are not coated. So seeds are often covered in chemicals and can decimate bird populations without you even knowing it. And you can often tell because they're artificially brightly colored and you can see it doesn't look natural. So you can see in that photo there that 
they look very different from other seeds that may be natural. Next slide, please. And habitat. So habitat goals for your yard are native plants. You want the right kind of plants and physical structure for birds to use in a number of ways. All plants should be native whenever possible. They are the best choice because birds evolve with these plants, not non-native plants. And the same is true for insects. Native plants support healthy insect populations for birds that rely on them for food. Audubon Plants for Birds has a nice website where you can enter your zip code and enter plants or birds that you're trying to attract to your yard. A local land trust or nature center can also be helpful. Wild Ones is another good resource for finding guidance on what kind of plants you can be using. Plants are not just important for food, but also for cover. Evergreens are important whether they're harsh winters. We mentioned Wisconsin earlier. I know Ken's from New York. Birds use those for roosting and protection from predators. So leaving brush and shrubs in place, good protection from the elements and from predators as well. Structures, multiple levels, different heights of plants, short shrubs, taller layers, trees, allowing for a much more diverse habitat is really great for birds. And minimizing grass as possible. Most birds won't utilize grass. You maybe have seen robins pulling worms out of the grass, but that's pretty much about it. Water features are helpful for birds. I'm pretty sure Mike mentioned that earlier. Um, make sure that they're flowing so that they don't attract mosquitoes. And habitat for insects is critical as a food source for birds. Even birds that show up at your feeder will feed their young mostly insects, not seeds. So good news for you. If you leave the leaves in your yard, it's less work, helps keep moisture in the ground, and it allows insects to survive the winter. And when birds return in the spring, there will be food for them. Don't cut down your flowers, even if they grow tall. Just leave the stems for birds to utilize in the winter, adds character and a place for birds. You can also get a bug hotel, which sounds kind of funny, but it's really fun. Uh, the bottom right photo here you can see, it's a place for bugs to hide and survive. And it all comes back to not spraying your yard with chemicals. And kids might find bug hotels fun too. And really the overall thought is that you don't want to devastate the ecosystem in your yard and you want to provide a natural habitat for birds to flourish and enjoy. So with that, I want to thank you all so much for letting me share that with you. And then I think we'll turn it over to Jordan Rutter for any questions from our folks. Okay, thank you everyone. I'm going to put um, some resources in the chat soon, but I just wanna say up front, we're gonna try and get through as many of the questions as you have, but if not, we will definitely give you resources and ways to reach out in the future to get those questions at, uh, answered. So first off, I'm gonna start with an easy one. If all of the presenters could share where they are from, that would be wonderful. Jen, do uh -huh. you wanna start? Just yeah, I know you already said, but. Sure, I, I currently live in Washington, D.C. So this has certainly been an interesting time to be quarantined. Um, don't have as many options as some of our field staff across the country to go out and have a lot of solitude and stay a lot of some people. So I've had to be incredibly resourceful about where I go to be able to get some exercise or see birds. Um, but I have been lucky enough to live in every major flyway in the U.S. So exciting. Mike, would you like to go next? Yeah, I'm also in Washington, D.C. Um, I've been here for 16 years and uh, travel around to do a lot of birding. But uh, it's been interest, an interesting experience that I'm mostly either working or on the road in my, in my work for ABC and have had little time really to focus on enjoying birds around my yard. And this has been a kind of reawakening of my yard birding. Um, which has actually been really fun. And it's been fun for the kids as well to get involved in it and spend some time just trying to learn the birds around the yard and help me with uh, setting up our bird Airbnb as it is now. now. Ken, would you like to go? Yeah, hi. So I'm, uh, I'm in Ithaca, New York, uh, which is uh, centrally isolated uh, in upstate New York where Cornell University and the Cornell Lab of Ornithology is. It snowed today and there were wind chills in the 20s in, on April 23rd. So 
Uh, I'm waiting for spring migration to really kick in here. We, have, we haven't had a whole lot. And if I'm going to catch up with my far as yard list competition, uh, we better send some migrants up north. Awesome. And Jeff? Uh, I am currently in Media, Pennsylvania, just south of Philadelphia, um, but I've lived much of my life in uh, the Wilmington, Delaware area, and also spent time in Austin, Texas, and Colorado Springs, Colorado. Wonderful. Okay, the next question is regarding non-native species. So, the Three Billion Birds paper was raised and it was mentioned by several people in the chat about non-native species and how they are the fastest declining of all of our species. Why should we care that non-native species are declining? Mike, do you want to take that one? Um, sure, I can. And I think Ken might want to add something to that. Um, so, well, there's a, I think there's a couple of, couple of things to think about here. One is that Birds are the canaries in the coal mine, and when you when you see widespread species that we thought were well adapted to a human environment, also suffering from declines on top of the birds that we've been concerned about for a long period of time, it's an indicator and it's a wake up call for us that there's obviously something amiss in our suburban and urban environments and in. in um, these, these species should sort of act as a warning signal to us. We need to learn more about what's driving those declines, but I think we all know that um, things like pesticides, insect loss, habitat loss, and some of these collisions and cat predation um, would appear to be amongst the top threats that affect those birds. The other thing that is also interesting is that some of these birds are actually declining heavily in their native ranges. Birds like house sparrows, which are native to Europe, have declined very significantly, uh, and European starlings have declined very significantly in Europe. So uh, ironically, it might eventually get to a point where the North American populations of some of these birds are of actual conservation significance for them. I don't think we're there yet, but it's something to keep an eye on for the future. Anyway, I'll turn that one to Ken, because he may have something to add, or if Jeff would like to add as well. No, I think that's exactly, that's it. I mean, one of the most surprising results of our analysis is that the, the huge loss of birds in North America is taking place among common familiar birds. And it's not just rare and threatened birds that are declining. And so, as Mike said, even if, even if these particular species like house sparrow and starling are not the ones we, we care about, the fact that they're declining along with, uh, with these other birds, if we can't even keep those invasive species healthy on the on their populations, healthy on the landscape, then that is what's really telling us that we have widespread problems. Absolutely. Um, given time, if I could get the next slide, please, um, that would be great. Uh, just because I want to make sure that folks know that we have our website here uh, with tons of information where you can learn more. Several folks had questions about window collisions, um, a lot of questions about pesticides as well. Um, I'm going to take just one or two more if that's okay with the presenters, but we will put information on how folks can get even more answers um, in a second. So I want to go to Jeff. This is switching gears completely, but Jeff, um, are there ways for my young birder at home to connect with other young birders right now? We had about uh, Ken with Cornell with the various at home activities but any community related aspects other than the Facebook page? Absolutely. Um, and there is a, an ABA Young Birders group on Facebook. Um, you can connect with that. Um, you can also um, go to our website, aba.org, and we have Young Birder resources. Um, we, one thing that's just starting right now is our Young Birder of the Year mentoring program, and that involves uh, opportunities for kids to do writing, photography, uh, illustration or painting, or uh, projects involving keeping a field notebook or doing a conservation and community leadership program. That's going to be a little trickier this year, but we'll figure out ways to do it. Um, in any event, uh, these kids get really mentored by the very best people in the field, get amazing supportive feedback, and 
Um, that program has a proven track record um, of producing really exceptional professionals in the field, um, like Jordan Rudder, <laughs> for example. <laughs> but um, no, it, um, it's, um, it's, you know, we really try hard to um, reach out and, and work with kids that have an interest. And, um, you know, I would invite you even to get in touch personally um, with me or with my wife, Liz. Um, and uh, we'd be happy to do whatever we can to help you out. Wonderful. Uh, I have another question for Mike. Uh, again, several, several questions about bird feeding. One of the ones that came up several times was about feeding birds year round. I've heard that bird feeding during the summer with young birds is not preferred or recommended. Um, would you speak to that, please? Yeah, I think, you know, once you get to, um, the summer and the breeding season, it's probably best to, to reduce feeding or eliminate feeding because the, you know, at that time of year, there should be plenty of natural food around for birds. And we don't want birds feeding uh, their chicks and getting used to things that they might not be able to find so much naturally. But I think through the, through the early part of the spring, uh, while we're on lockdown, I don't think you're gonna find any problems at that point. But yes, once you get to the part of the breeding season, I think it would be better to, to eliminate feeding. It's not. It shouldn't be necessary at that point either, because there should be plenty of uh, insects and bugs and other things around for birds. Okay, Jen, I have one for you about additional resources for the items that you shared. Uh, specifically, what can I share with my neighbors whose cats come into my yard? So that is an excellent question. Um, the first caveat I will say is that our invasive species director, Grant Sizemore, who handles the Cats and Dogs program, I will do my very best to make him proud with the answer to that. I definitely think that's a tough one. Um, I grew up having outdoor cats, and I didn't know until I got older that they were not a part of the natural ecosystem, and that wasn't a really good idea. And, you know, we love our pets often like we would love our own family. So it is really hard to talk to somebody about that and suggest that they could keep their cats indoors. I know I've had to have that conversation with my own family members. Um, one thing that I suggest that I find to be a really happy medium are the catios that we had mentioned before. So, you know, it is sometimes hard to keep a cat indoors that used to live outside, but it's definitely possible. And a catio is a really nice way to allow cats to be outdoors to be confined, it keeps them safe and it keeps birds safe and they get a lot of enjoyment and enrichment out of it. Thank you. Um, I also have been getting a lot of species specific questions such as uh, what is best for Baltimore Orioles? How high should bluebird houses be? Um, Mike, do you wanna take this in terms of where folks can learn more about species specific questions? Yeah, sure. Um, on specifically on Baltimore Orioles, um, you know, I find that that uh, just little sections of orange are, you know, half an orange or a quarter of an orange um, placed on a, a branch. What I do is I take a sharp knife, cut the orange, and then you can just uh, make a little hole in the in the in the rind of the orange and then slide it onto a onto a uh, a dead branch somewhere. I actually put up a stick um, specially for that. Um, but, you know, you can actually, you know, if you can find a, a live branch, you can do that. Or there's also feeders that you can put those on. Um, I would just suggest for those types of things, you know, I, at this time, we have to order a lot of stuff online because a lot of the, the stores are closed. Some of the wild bird stores are doing curbside pickup and, the, and those sort of things where you can order and go pick up. But I would take a look at some of the websites because there's lots of great products. There's a number of stores that do it. Uh, and you know the specialty stores and also some of the large box stores offer these types of things. As far as the bluebird boxes, we don't have bluebirds here and I have to put up bluebird boxes around our property. Um, I usually see them maybe five, six, seven feet off the ground, but I would just recommend taking a look at the websites when you purchase the bluebird box and look for the specific advice there. I'm not sure if Jeff and Ken have a specific height for bluebird boxes. Um, you may find that tree swallows also like to use boxes sometimes maybe put out for bluebirds uh, of course that's great uh, to have tree swallows but um yeah i think best to look at, for the instructions there but i'll turn it over to ken or jeff if they've got an exact height for bluebird boxes 
Well, I'll just add um, that in terms of resources at the uh, at the Cornell Lab website that I mentioned earlier, the Citizen Science page, um, there's a lot of species specific information on the Project Peter Watch site about how to attract various kinds of birds. Um, and also on the Nest Watch site, a lot of information on bluebirds and any other species you want to put up boxes for. So I recommend, uh, you know, checking out the the sites that, that Jordan has up here, as well as the Cornell site and ABA, ABA site for a lot of the deeper um, resources about these questions. Wonderful. Thank you, presenters. Given time, I'm going to ask for the next slide. Again, I apologize that we didn't get to all of the questions. We are here for you and have lots of resources online. Um, connect with us on social media. We're more than happy to talk birds with you. Uh, and I'll turn it back over to Mike now. Great. Well, um, thank you everybody for joining. Um, thank you again to the presenters and to the ABC staff who helped put this webinar together. We're really pleased that you're able to join. We hope that this has been informative. And more than anything, we hope that you really uh, enjoy birds this spring. Uh, this is going to be you know, a fabulous migration. And as Jeff said, migration will come to you. And any day now in where we are in the mid-Atlantic, we're going to be, I hope, inundated with warblers. It's the most exciting time of the year for birding. And there's still time if you, don't, if you haven't set your garden up, your backyard, you can do some things that will make it more hospitable to birds with water features and things like that. We really hope you enjoy birds. And we ho hope that you also will take some steps to protect them, particularly with some of the window treatments and other things around the home. So thank you for joining. I hope you found it informative. We are so glad that you came. You can support the organizations behind it. We'd appreciate that. And I want to close by Again, thanking my co-presenters, Jennifer, Jeff, and Ken, uh, and also Jordan for helping with the moderating. And uh, again, to all of you for joining, Claire, uh, Connor, and Darius. Thanks very much. This was a great session, and we really appreciate it. So thank you all, and we hope to let you know about future webinars soon. Thanks all. Good birding. Good Bye, birding. everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.